Hi, my name is Frederick and welcome to another Amaya to Blender tip video. Today we will be talking about the hypershade, the hypershade that is in Maya and the lack of a hypershade that is in Blender. So in Blender there is no hypershade at all and when I started to go over to Blender I kind of missed it. So basically the hypershade in Maya is a tool where you can deal with all the nodes that you need for your shader network. Well, it's really convenient because all the nodes are in the same place and you can connect all nodes that you need to a shader network, but reuse certain nodes in, in another network. And it's basically one big pool of nodes where you can make your connections between all those different nodes. And uh, Blender doesn't has this at all. It works completely different and it kind of, yeah, you have to get used to this particular system. So in this video, I like to explain how Blender does it and the best way to use this, or at least the way I like to use it. Yeah, there's no hypershade. Let's let's start off with the uh, cube that I always use in my videos. Now, I always use really simple geometry because I want to illustrate the point. I'm not trying to teach you any particular modeling or certain things. I want to keep it as simple as possible so you understand the core of the issue and not get lost in details of other things or complicated models. So let's start off with a cube and I add immediately a second cube to it and let's move it over here so they don't block each other. Let's move our standard light a little bit further back. Okay, the best way of shading things is actually up here you got quite a bit of tabs and there's this shading part which gives you a better layout for dealing with shading. Now, it kind of um, immediately goes to like an interactive view to do your shading. And it uses the, like the viewport shading engine or the viewport render engine, which is slightly different than EV or Cycles. Now, I have a really fast graphics card and I prefer to actually go to the, the real deal the way that it actually is going to look in, in cycles. Now, as you can see, it updates incredibly fast. I have set it to 1024 samples and when I move it, it's immediately done. So for me, it's not a really an issue. If you have a slower computer, this might be a little bit frustrating to work with. And maybe then the viewport shading is actually a better choice for you. But I'm going to uh, use it this way. Okay, we have the most important windows is this particular window where we can actually see our objects and down here, which will be uh, where our nodes are visible. So let's select the first cube. And as you can see, when you select an object, you get all these property tabs here. And the bottom one, the red one is the material properties. When you click on it, you get a little window, which is empty and you can actually create a new shader. So let's do that. There you go it will immediately attach a principled BSDF shader to your object. This is a standard shader that is most used in Blender. Now, if you wanna have a completely different shader, you can go into the menu here and there's quite a bit of shaders which you can choose off. Uh, there's anisotropic shaders, glass shaders, glossy shaders, holdout shaders. You can even mix shaders. But let's use the principled BSDF shader because it's just to illustrate a point how things work. You always have a material output part and whatever you build, you need to connect it up to that particular output. And in the output, there's a couple of certain types of shaders. You have the surface shader, the volume shader and the displacement shader. So you can use three networks that go in those particular slots. But let's keep it to the surface shader because the other ones are just more of the same. Okay, so let's have a look. First, we'll make it a certain color, for example. So you can immediately see it updating in here. And when we, whenever we click on a different object, you're gonna see that here it is empty again. And then you have a choice to create a new shader or there's this little drop down menu and you can actually use the same shader. So, and it is really the same shader. So if I wanna change this to uh, red for, or orange red, it will actually change the color. So it's exactly the same shader and it is actually connected up to those two objects. Now, of course, if you wanna have a different object connected to it, you can get rid of this and create a new one and for example, give it a green color. 
And there you go, you got now completely diff different and separate shaders for these objects. The good part here is that it's all node-based and it's exactly like in Maya. So if you're used to working with a shader networks, this is going to be pretty much the same. So the way to access all your nodes is to go to the add section here and then you have the whole menu of all the nodes that are built in. What I find quicker to use is that you can press tap and then if you know the name of the node, you can start typing and you can get a short list of the nodes that are having that particular name. And when you press enter, uh, they will come into your shading network. So for me, that's a little bit a quicker way of working. Once you get used to the names, uh, this will speed up your workflow quite a bit. So yeah, I chose for an image texture uh, node here and let's connect it up to the base color of this particular shader. And you see immediately this turns pink. That's because we haven't chosen a shader yet. And then the default value is gonna be a pinkish color. So let's open up a texture. I collected, uh, let's, let's pick a wood one. There you go. And as you can see, we have a wood texture connected to this cube. And that's the way it basically works. This is exactly the same way as in Maya. So you won't find any difficulties here. If you want to add in a node, for example, a U saturation node to give it a certain color, let's give it a slightly different color. Then you can just drag it in. Let me do that again. So let's disconnect this. And when you just move it over, you're going to see that the connection between those uh, nodes is becoming white and then when you drop it in it actually puts it in between as you may have noticed there's uh, one material assigned now uh, let's call this one wood by the way that makes it easier and let's choose to make this one a brick texture and i'll quickly connect up another image texture for this particular uh, shader uh, let's quickly choose something here, bricks, there you go, and there you go. You may have noticed that this is actually a list and uh, you can add in more shaders than one. So for example, let's pick this particular wood shader or this particular object with the wood shader on and add in an extra shader slot. And let's just pick the brick one and nothing seems to have happened, right? So yes, we can access both shaders, but the wood texture stays just the wood texture. So uh, how can you use multiple shader slots then? Well, we have to go into edit mode for that. So when I press three, I go into edit mode. And whenever I press uh, or select a particular face, it will actually show which shader it is assigned to and you have you get these buttons over here so for example let's say we want to make this a brick shader we uh, select the brick we have selected the face and then we assign it and as you can see that particular brick shader has connected to that particular face now if you for example you want to have all the faces selected with brick and you want to change it back to wood, you can just assign it and it changes back to the one with the wood shader in this case. So that's the reason why you have multiple material slots and that's the easy way to actually assign shaders to particular faces. Blender has a special way of managing shaders and certain data blocks. To illustrate this, let's quickly uh, create another shader. So for example, I don't want to have this one anymore. I just quickly create a red shader um, and give it a red color like so and then because I want to have want to have the wood shader on there for later purposes uh, let's disconnect the red one now as you can see there's a little zero in front of the red one which means that that particular shader is not in use anymore the way of deleting data blocks or shaders in blender is a bit peculiar in my mind. So you can't really delete it out of this list. So if you have a lot of shaders and you say like, oh, I don't want to have that in this list anymore, then this list doesn't allow you to delete it. You can't really say delete because 
it just if you disconnect the shader it just gets this zero in front of it now there's two ways of getting rid of that particular shader and the first one is probably the easiest one and immediately shows the danger when you create shaders that you don't use anymore the first bit is if you save your file and you reopen that particular file again then you're going to see you see the layout has changed so i have reloaded the file and then when i'm going to have a look you're going to see that that particular uh, shader is gone so unused data blocks are still preserved when you have your blender file open but once you save them they get ditched or they get removed you have to keep that in mind because if you want to keep a shader in your file yeah, better assign it to a certain object. So let's say you've put up a whole shading network and you think, yeah, I'm gonna use it later. Then you have to connect it to an object because once you save it and it's not connected, it's gonna be lost. Another way of deleting a shader. So let's, for example, quickly create a new red one to illustrate this. Let's call it red. And get rid of it again. You're gonna see that there's a zero in front of it. The other way of deleting a shader, if you really want to get rid of it in, without saving, is that you go to the Blender file like menu up here and it shows you all the objects that are part of this Blender file. And then if you go to Materials, you're going to see that red is actually there and you can right click and press delete and it's gone. And when you check over here, it's gonna be out of the menu. So you can force delete it, it's possible. Keep in mind that whenever you don't use a shader and you save it and the data block is not used, it's gonna be lost. So you don't think like, where's my shader gone? I have constructed this whole network and now it's gone. You have to assign it to an object basically. Now I wanna cover one last thing and that is reusability of nodes. So every shader has their own network going on so when you go to the other shader you're gonna see it's it's actually a, a small container with nodes and you can't really drag this particular node on top of anything else yeah that's kind of inconvenient because let's say you have two shaders which are slightly different let's illustrate this by maybe give the bricks here some subsurface and let's give it a color uh, like this bluish color. So it's really clear that this particular brick is different. Now let's say I want to have this uh, brick texture also on here, but I don't want to have the subsurface activated on this particular object, right? So what I first thought like, okay, I pick this node and copy it by pressing Ctrl C and then I'm pasting it here. And then I thought like, okay, now this is the same node and I'll connect it up and um, yeah, it looks like the same node, but let's say, oh, I want to use the wood texture and then you go, uh, gonna pick it, the wood again, and then you see it's not changing that node. It's actually, a, it's, it's a copy. It's not a, the same instance of that node, right? So yeah, that's not the way I want to work because I want to use parts of the same network in another node. So there's a way of doing this, luckily. Let's go back to this particular uh, texture node, right? And I want to use it over here. Let's put in a use saturation node in here as well. Give it a slightly different color. There you go. And let's say I want to have, uh, I want to use this on this particular uh, object as well, or at least having that uh, part of the chaining network connected also to the right hand cube. The way to do is this select the nodes you want to have connected to the other network and then you can go to the node menu and say create group. You can also press ctrl G in the industry standard interface and then you're going to see that suddenly your nodes that you have selected are in their own special environment. The way to get out of it is just double clicking and then you go to the shading network again and you're going to see that the nodes are actually replaced by a node group and if i click on it i can go to towards uh, what's inside and you got a group input and a group output so you can build a whole group 
that that can be reused with inputs and everything. When you double click again, you get out of it. And then you have to give it a name. Now I'm gonna call it texture uh, U is just the name uh, for me to remember what it is. And if you going to look into the menu, you're gonna see there's a texture U node here. Okay, so I wanna get rid of this. Don't want that anymore. And I wanna use this particular group that we used over here, and I want to use it over here, but this time I don't want to use the subsurface. What you could do is go to uh, add group, and then the one you actually named is going to be in that menu. So I call the texture U, and as you can see, it's going to be in there. And there's a little two here that indicates it's actually a part of two shading networks. And you're going to see when I connect it up to the base color, I have reused that part of the shading network but this node doesn't have any subsurface and if i want to go into it and i want to change its value let's put the u back on what it was before you're going to see that it updates for both the objects so that's a really convenient way to save you lots of work because let's say if you have like 20 shaders and you want to have like the middle part of it exactly the same you have to do it 20 times and then your client comes around and it says like, yeah, but I want to have a change in it. You have to change it 20 times. And this way you can just make one group of nodes and create a network that is based on that same group of nodes. And whenever a client asks a change, you have only have to change that in one group. So that covers about the shading in Blender. As you may have noticed, it's a bit different. There is no hypershade, so there's no one tool to do everything in. Uh, you don't have this big pool of nodes where you can connect everything to everything. Luckily, there's the uh, node-based workflow, which is very similar to Maya. The way to get around to reusing nodes is by using groups. That way you can kind of have a very similar workflow as in Maya. The only weird thing is, of course, the deletion of data blocks or the deletion of shaders. Make sure that you remember that if you disconnect a shader and you save your file, it's going to be lost. And that's going to save you a lot of grief if you remember that tip. Now, if you like this video, press like. And I really hope you subscribe to this channel as well. It will help me to create more of these kind of videos. So yeah, make sure you do. That's it for this particular video on hypershade and shading. I hope to see you next time. Bye.